have a very special guest with me tonight. I have well-known boxing identity, Steve Lawson. How are you doing tonight, Steve? Terrific. Nice and hot here in Las Vegas. Oh, th thank you very much for joining me. My pleasure. All right. Now, of course, casual fans know you because of your association with Mike Tyson, but I want to talk about you for a second and your history and talk to us a little bit about your history with boxing and how it first began. Well, I was very fortunate. I played a sport called handball. It's an American handball, almost like squash. Uh, the world's champion was a man named Jim Jacobs. He, of course, owned a company with Bill Caton that owned all the fight films in the world. And uh, as a handball player, Jim and I played quite a bit. When I became 21 years old, I asked him for a job at this fight film company editing films. And it was wonderful watching all day Ali, Lewis, Dempsey, Marciano, which was a tremendous amount of fun. And then, of course, they became managers of fighters. What I want to talk to you about is your extraordinary photography collection, which now, which now is property of the uh, Las Vegas Hall of Fame. Why don't you talk to us a, a little bit about that and, and how that started? Because that's extraordinary. It's just incredible. Yes, the of course, Katen, Bill Katen and Jim Jacobs, they were collectors also. So while they were still managing fighters and selling the fight films, they were collecting photographs to, to complement the, the films of the fights. They were very fortunate in getting very large libraries of photos, both from the press and from individuals, and especially a collection called the, the Dana Collection, uh, this great photographer at the turn of the century from 1910 to 1914, shot incredible photographs throughout the United States on these glass plate negatives. This, of course, was way before digital photography and even film photography. And there are thousands of these plates in addition to the hard copy or photographs that everyone knows of, things like Jack Dempsey fights and Joe Lewis fights, it's incredible stuff of the training of the fighters behind the scenes with their families, and, of course, the fights. And there are many photographs of fights where the films do not exist. So it's the only image of the actual fighter in the ring with a fighter where you really can't see the film of the fight. Those are the very special photographs. Let's talk about your association with Mike Tice first began. Well, Jim Jacobs and Bill Caton were funding the training camp in Catskill, New York, where Customato had his home and the gym. And uh, this began in the early 70s. Uh, every once in a while, uh, Cuss would call Caton and Jacob and say, I got a kid. He could be special. And uh, if he becomes a professional, uh, Bill and Jim, uh, you, got, you guys will be the manager. So as the years went by, uh, Cuss would call every once in a while. In 1980, he called Caton and Jacob and said, I got a kid. He's going to be something, and that kid was Mike Tyson. Uh, Mike fought in the amateurs from 85, 80 to 85 and turned pro, and Kate and Jacobs became managers. Fortunately for me, because they had managed other fighters before, and my job was to make sure that everything around the fighter went well, from the training to the sparring to the press uh, to the medicals to all of the documents, when Mike turned pro, I was given that opportunity also to work with Mike and handle all of that stuff. So it was a very long process of 80 to 85. Cuss spent five years in, in honing Mike. We had the luxury of getting Mike in 1985, and that was after a college degree with, with Customato. This world champion in history, the world was set at Mike's feet then in... Uh... 1988, things just started to go wrong, didn't they? Well, it's interesting. Uh, you're correct. It's interesting that from 85 to 88 with Caitlin and Jacobs, everything that could possibly go right went right. And then once Mike got to Robin Gibbons and Don King, everything that could possibly go wrong went wrong. 
you know, there's a common misconception that in 88, Mike was either uh, over the hill or he lost interest or uh, he burnt out or that he was, the money got to him, he was making too much money, got spoiled. Not in the least. It was an exact line of demarcation when Robin and Don entered the picture in 88, his career was over. Uh, Mike was making millions of dollars in 86 and 87. He had no problem. He was under more pressure than any athlete in the world in 86 and 87. No problem. Commercials on TV. Spokesperson for the police department, for the Federal Bureau of Investigation, for the Drug Enforcement Administration. Huge worldwide acclaim. Voted the world's most popular athlete. Actually, he was tied with this legendary soccer player, uh, Diego Maradona. Uh, most popular athlete in the world. Not the best athlete, not even best boxer. Most popular. Yeah, well. Once Robin entered the picture, that was it. Robin recognized Don right away. And when, in the uh, summer of 88, when Don King wanted Mike to break away from manager Bill Caton, he gave Mike a contract to sign. Yeah. Mike, being the very dutiful husband, gave it to Robin to say, hey, you handle the business. I don't want anything to do with business. When her attorney looked at it, she realized that if Mike had signed it, he would get, Don would steal everything. So she banned Don King from Mike's life for that entire summer of 88. Uh, Don King couldn't get a phone call through until the very famous Barbara Walker show, that was it. Well, unless you're a sociopath, like Robin was. Yeah. And when you're a sociopath, then you only have one objective. What's best for yourself? What's best for your own pocketbook? And that was a simple decision for Robin. Uh, she couldn't care anything about Mike. She just wanted the money. It just seems incomprehensible that such a, a, a fruitful... And, and lucrative partnership like the, the Catskill partnership was could be broken up. Yes, once um, uh, the Barbara Walker show took place and Robin and Mike broke up, Don was brilliant. Brought Mike to Cleveland, got him laid 44 times a day, started getting into Mike's head. Uh, you know, people uh, uh, make a huge mistake by saying that or thinking that Mike was easily taken over by Don. Don is one of the great con men of all time. If, if Don only conned Mike, if, he was, if Mike was the only fighter that fell for Don, I'd say, wow, that's something. But Ollie, Holmes, Tubbs, Witherspoon, Smith, Thomas, Tucker, Duran, Chavez, Gomez, Zerati, Zamora, the U.S. government, I mean, there's no contest, you know. Mike was emotionally distraught, and Don was able to take advantage of it. Uh, all right, I'll just have a... A uh, couple more questions. Um, Mike Tyson Promotions is unfortunately no longer. Can, can you give us an, any insight as to what happened there? And would Mike think about getting back into promoting in the future? Well, Mike loves boxing, number one, and he loves working with fighters. Uh, he, uh, a promoter uh, uh, reached out to him uh, three years ago and said, you know, Mike, I've got these great fighters, or I should say, I have fighters, but I can't move them because we don't have enough pizzazz. We don't have enough, enough juice. But with your name, Mike, they'll get a lot of, a tr they'll get a lot of notoriety. Yeah. So they come to the team, a promotion company, worked for about two years together, but unfortunately, the partner, a financial guy, had very big problems with the government and finances. Oh, my God. And they exploded. Yeah, they exploded, and Mike realized that it would be very bad to continue the relationship, so he said, thank you very much, goodbye. So they severed their relationship, and, which was best for Mike. He's looking to get back into the boxing, and he loves working with Kreider, uh, so that will happen eventually. It hasn't happened yet. Um, what, what are the, what are the uh, future plans for... Um Mike, at the moment, anything on the horizon? Well, Mike is doing so many things. Uh, he just finished three weeks in China with a Kung Fu film with a legendary Kung Fu actor, Donnie Chen. So that's going to be out. Uh, he's doing appearances all over the world. Uh, of course, he has coming up almost signing the Mike Tyson movie with uh, Jamie Foxx. Uh, he's doing a huge gaming deal with a gaming company. 
So there's a lot of stuff going on that he does that takes a lot of his time, but he still would love to work with Biden. How, how do you think uh, Mike would go against the modern modern heavyweights? Uh, Mike in his prime of the mid-80s against people like uh, Vladimir Klitschko and Deontay Wilder and, and um, Tyson Fury and those guys. How do you think Mike would do in the, the heavyweight division these days? Whenever Mike fought a guy back in 85 to 88, when he was in his prime, whenever he fought a guy that was easy to hit or came to fight, the fight was over quick. Yeah. Now, whenever I look at a fighter in the past, whether it's Dempsey, Lewis, Marciano, Robinson, I never look at the fighter after his prime. I look at them during their prime and how they fought at their very best during their prime and how they fought at their very worst during their prime. At the very best during his prime, Klitschko is really good. But at his worst, he gets hit and cut and busted up. Mike, during his prime, when he was good, he was blistering. But even when he was bad, he was still winning every minute of his fight against Phyllis, Smith, Tucker, you know, and Green. Every minute, he never got hit. So uh, with Mike, unless a fighter is Muhammad Ali, I would kick Mike over Crisco. Actually, even today, if you brought them both to Catskill, New York, where there's no press, and put the gloves on both of them, and had a referee there with nobody around, and the bell rang for round one, I would not get against Mike. Mm-hmm. I've seen him hit the bag last year, and it is scary still. Scary. <laughs> so, but he would never be able to train under the pressure of the microscope of the press. When we look back at Mike's career, Youngest heavyweight champion in history, unified all the titles. But is Mike's career still a case of what might have been, but what should have been? Continuing on the way they should have, would would Mike be up there with guys like Lewis, Marciano, Dempsey and those guys? Well, when a fighter is viewed by the public, there are two portions of the public. The boxing public and the vast majority of the mainstream. The boxing guys will rate Mike pretty high up there. The public, unfortunately, still remember some of the bad stuff. The rape, the ear fighting, that's, that, that's, that's bad. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what could have been, well, if Ali never, uh, took a stance against the Vietnam War, and he fought Frazier in 71, there would have been no contest. Ali would have just chopped him up. But unfortunately, there was the Vietnam War. And Ali was out of boxing for two and a half years. So with Mike, I mean, if there was never a Robin Gibbons or Don King, I mean, the fights we missed, the fights we missed, Tyson, Tommy Morrison, Tyson, Riddick Bowe, Tyson, George Foreman. You know, uh, I was just looking at some newspaper clippings of Tyson and Michael Spinks. The, the pay-per-view numbers were monstrous back in 88. If that would fight took place today would dwarf would dwarf Mayweather and Pacquiao. And, but and that's what if. And you can never go by what if. And don't forget, um a better size against uh uh Holyfield in in nineteen ninety one, the the fight that should have happened that uh the uh rape uh, conviction stopped. That fight too. Well, you know, with Mike it's very difficult for everyone, boxing of people, writers, and the mainstream to understand that fighters, it's, it's about 65% emotional and psychological and only 35% physical. Mike, because of the Don King era and the way he was perceived after all that bad stuff, he was emotionally shot, not physically shot emotionally, and that was bad. Yeah. Prior to 88, he was emotionally very strong, and that would always keep him in good stead. So with Mike, once his emotions were shot and the public disliked him, that was bad. He That's why he looked so bad against almost everyone after 1988. Mike in recent years seems, it seems a lot more at peace. He, he, he seems happy. He's, he's been in the, the hangover comedy movies. In fact, there's a whole generation 
that actually don't know him as a fighter, they know him as that guy from the you know, stage show and the, the funny guy that, that goes on celebrity roasts and stuff like that. But are you, are you, are you pleased to see that after all this, Mike seems to be at peace now and, and the public is seeing perhaps who the real Mike Tyson is? Well, they, well, it's a good point you brought up. The mainstream is made up of two factors. The old timers like me and the young crowd that really goes through Mike. The hangover crowd, uh, the, the Mike Tyson mystery series on TV, so the cartoon series. They don't, they don't really remember the stuff from the 90s, which I'm delighted. But the old timers, you know, the people who are 50, 55, 60 and up, uh, they remember that era. And that's, they, they feel a little differently about that. So fortunately for Mike, as the years go by now, there'll be a lot more younger crowd, and they will not reflect too much or remember that bad era. It's pleased to see that um, Mike's at, at peace now, and he seems happy with his with his life, and he's got a deserved place in in the boxing hall of fame. And um, hopefully, things now and, and the future will continue to look bright for Mike. Thank you very much for. Giving me your time. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Steve. Bye. Bye now. Bye.